Hey, y'all, it's Virginia. So welcome to Cookbooks with Virginia. My name is Virginia Willis. I am a chef and cookbook author based out of Atlanta, Georgia. And each and every Friday or near about each and every Friday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am able to feature some of my favorite books. Okay, so do y'all remember when you were a kid and you would stay up all night with the covers pulled up over your head and a flashlight? Okay, maybe you weren't complete nerd like I was, but that was me, right? Staying up all night with the flashlight reading the book. That is what this book reminds me of. Gastro Obscura, A Food Adventurer's Guide. It's crazy. It's just really wonderful. And um, I hate this so much. You have no idea um, because we have been so excited about this. And there's some kind of technical problem. But someone told me that Mercury was in retrograde. Whatever, Mercury, you're always like in the wrong place at the wrong time. So anyway, Dylan may or may not join me this morning, but I can tell you all all about this book and we can talk a little bit about it. So first up. This week's book is uh, Gastro Obscura. It's brought to you by the folks that bring you Atlas Obscura. And this is really amazing. It's basically um, flavor-filled journeys from all over the world. So we start out um, we start out with Europe and Asia, Africa, Oceania, uh, Canada, Latin America, Antarctica. Who knew that there were uh, food traditions in Antarctica? And, you know, do you want to know all about 4 million women making rice pudding at the same time? Or would you like to know about presidential cheese? It seemed that there's a there's a correlation between presidents and cheese. Or perhaps do you want to know that people that there first of all, that there really was a great molasses flood in Boston and that people actually died, that molasses coursed through the streets of Boston at 35 miles an hour. Y'all, that's not slow. Okay, so let's see what we got going on here. I don't know if we're going to get to see Dylan or not. Oh, hey, Aaron. Yay, Tammy Cook. Tammy Cook. And we got Aaron. I appreciate y'all. Um, appreciate y'all joining me today. So it's really, truly, um, I, I, I've been, I pick it up at night and then I have to set an alarm so that I will put it down and, and go to sleep. So, hey, Mary, that's great. I appreciate your sweet note this morning. So this book, uh, Gastro Obscura, um, really, okay, I'm going to read a little bit about the back. Uh, like a great tapas meal, Astro, Gastro Obscura is deep yet snackable and full of surprises. So you can win a copy of this book. Um, what you're going to do, please, is you're going to go to my Instagram feed and you're going to like me on Instagram and you're going to like Gastro Obscura. And then on Monday, we're going to enter, uh, we're going to enter to win, um, a, a, copy of the book and it's so cool. So yay. Hey, Marsha and, um, small bites. Yes. It's really, it really is truly amazing. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna like literally like throw a dart board dart at the board and see what happens. Okay. So I have opened up to Canada and Western Canada and it, the, uh, the title of this article is wild berries for bartering and pie. All right. So in River Landing, Saskatoon, there is a statue of the city's founder, John Lake, crouched behind Chief Whitecap of the Dakota First Nation tribe. With his arm outstretched, Chief Whitecap get gestures to the land before him, an expanse that was once so full of Saskatoon berries, they named the city after them. All right, so it says Saskatoons are small purple berries with a sweet almond flavor. They grow wild in North America and played a key role in the diets of indigenous peoples and earlier coloners, coloner, colonizers who pounded them into cakes and used them as a sweetener. According to an account from 1900, the berries were once so valuable that 10 Saskatoon cakes could be traded for one large buckskin. I, I eat that kind of <laughs> worthless information up like a Sunday with a cherry on top. I love that kind of stuff. Hey, mama, look, it's my mama. Hey, y'all. Hey, mama. 
and my sweet papa. Hey, papa. I love you, papa. I'm glad you're here today. Oh, yay. That's so sweet. Hey, Pat, you've been recommended by my friend Patrick Wesley Bryan. Well, Patrick Wesley Bryan is one of my sweet, sweet friends. Oh, Tammy Cook, you had Saskatoon's at Camp Canola. I loved me some Camp Canola. All right. So um, let's see. Let's just find us another page. Because like I said, we had a little bit of a um, little bit of a trouble, a technical trouble this morning with um, with Dylan and the folks at Gastro Obscura. So I'm glad to know that Mercury in retrograde isn't just affecting me this week. So um, do you like avocados? Think this extinct giant sloth. All right. Mexico is the avocado cop capital of the world with two central states, AKA the avocado belt, supplying nearly half of the global market. An Aztec symbol of love and fertility turned into a cosmopolitan salad ingredient. The treaty, trendy green fruit has been a hit since prehistoric times when it got its first big break from an unwitting benefactor. Though lestodonts might sound like toothy, toothy scale, scaly dinosaurs, the Cenozoic area creatures were sloths, direct descendants, no, direct ancestors of the sloths still found today, but the Lestodons were enormous, putting the mega and megafauna weighing from two to four tons. Lestodons, other when the other ground sloths roamed the grassy plains in South America. Their diet consisted of grass, foliage, and occasionally a more nutritious treat, the early avocado. So these enormous creatures' digestive systems could process the large seeds and Avocados benefited when pooped out far from their parent trees. The seeds could sprout and grow without competition for water and sunlight. It was a good deal all around and likely resulted in lar avocados as we know them today. Fatty and large pitted, all the more likely to attract giant sloths. Well, there you are. So next time that you are eating on your avocado avocado toast in the morning, you can thank the fact that it's you're benefiting from it, from the fact that a giant sloth ate it and pooped it out centuries ago. Okay, let's see. Um, Ginger is saying, I prefer the cakes to the buckskin. I don't know. I got a but I like a buckskin, but I'd like to have a cake too. All right. Um, oh, Debbie Loftus loves my hair. Well, I thought you'd seen it. All right, here we go. Mmm, avocados, they're really good this time of year. They are really good this time of year. So y'all, okay, let's see what's happening. I got a private chat. Uh, oh, Dylan is here, but let me see how to let Dylan in. Oh, yay, there's Dylan. Uh, internet meltdown. I live in, I live. Uh, okay, we can't hear York Dylan yet. Our, right here, Can we hear Dylan? Hello, hello, hello. Um, I'm um, appropriately in my kitchen. Look, we both can see our pots and pans behind both of our heads. I know, I know. Yeah, hey, a little, a little major internet malfunction. But hi, Virginia. Um, so sorry I'm late, but nice to see. No, you. man, it's so cool. I was just, um, I was just singing your praises about this awesome book and saying that it's like, a, I feel like a kid reading it. That I want to hide underneath the covers and just stay up all night. That's, I'm glad to hear that. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah, I mean, and and uh, so thank you, and and I'm sorry. I know it's hard to like spring into action with internet and nope. technical. Terms. No, let's do it. But um, okay, like, how the hell did you come up with this idea? This is like it, G G gastro obscura. It needs to be called like genius obscura. I mean, you've got like little little bon mots and little treats and treasures for foodies all over the world. It. Thank you for saying that. I really, really appreciate it. 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 You know, it flows entirely out of the sort of original project, which is Atlas Obscura, which started mm -hmm. over a decade ago now. Started Josh, uh, Josh Foer, my co-founder and I. Um, it started almost really as an art project. We just wanted uh -huh. to make this place where people could come and find all of the kind of incredible outsider art projects and little museums that, that you know, sort of weren't showing up in traditional yeah. travel guides. and. Yeah. We did this by building this kind of community of people who could uh, share with us their thoughts of like, here's an incredible place that I grew up next to. People don't know it's there, but it's just like absolutely wonderful. And that's how we grew Atlas. And, and Gastro kind of it was a really natural extension of that idea. I mean, food and travel are so intimately connected. 
And they're both ways, they're both sort of just uh, keyholes into the world's culture, its history, its diversity, the sort of beautiful pluralism of, of, of the world. And, and, you know, we just realized that, that a plate of food in front of you is like an invitation right. to the whole world. And so that's sort of where it all started. Yeah. No, that's so cool. I, it, I love, and I think that's one of the reasons I'm so attracted to this because I think that um, I've long felt that like basically everything we are about being a human, your religion, your education, um, you know, how you feel about art, history, play, our, our place in the world, in my mind, is defined by what's on the end of our fork. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and I love that um, just the organic journey of finding all these little cool places. But then, of course, food was there, too. Right. It's so integral to our lives. Yeah. And I think I mean, one of the yeah, one of the big ideas of of Atlas has always been that you don't have to get on a plane and travel halfway around the world to have an incredible, amazing, wondrous experience. And, and I think one of the ideas of gastro is sort of fundamentally, you know, it's not a fancy restaurant book. It's not right. a sort of right. high end sh chef book. It, it's about our relationships to food, sort of wherever you are. And one of the, the other things that was sort of beautiful to see about working on the book is how many, how much food connects us to the world. Like I, I mm -hmm. can give two examples. So I, I grew up uh, eating pickled herring um, uh -huh. uh, and loving it as a kid, still love it. Uh, and I would go to these fairs where you could see giant 90 pound uh, blocks of butter being sculpted into uh, portraits of, of people. And with saying those two things, most people can guess where I am from right. in, in the United States. They, they can have a pretty good, um, you know, it doesn't take that much to sort of use food to position. So I'm from the, the well, I'll, I'll let you guess. Do you want to make a, a, any, any educated guess about the area of the country I might be I, from? I would, I would think wisconsin -y area. Very close, Minnesota. <laughs> Very close, yeah. Minister, okay, so, yeah. So yeah. You've got your dairy producing states yeah. up there. Yeah. you got your state fairs and, and very strong, um, lot of Scandinavian immigrants. Yeah. Uh, so that's where you get your pickled herring, your lessa, your lutefisk. And um, and the same was true with my co-author, Cecily Wong. Mm -hmm. she, her parents, she grew up in Portland, but her parents are from Hawaii. So she uh, ate uh, Spam Musubi and wow. uh, macaroni salad. And again, you hear those two things and most people say, oh, Hawaii, right out of the gate. And um, oh, I'm glad people can hear me. Uh, <laughs> that's important. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to distract you. I'm just like, no, 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 no. <laughs> I, I, uh, yeah. So, so it's just food, food sort of draws these, these connections uh, across the whole world. And food is this process of kind of food cultures crashing into each other and new things being born out of that. Um, no, it's so cool. I have a, I have a friend from college and her, her family was Scandinavian and her, her one um, sort of perusing about that, like when they all came over from the old country, what made them think that they had to settle in the same type of climate? You know what I mean? Like, instead of like going south to the Caribbean or, you know, like, but, but we want, we, we want the familiar. I mean, it's, I think that it's, it's tribal, right? Wouldn't you say that? I mean, it's kind of cool because it's like, Something as obscure as, you know, whatever, cornmeal mush might sound like a really exotic to some people. But for my people, hell, grits are about as comforting as they can get. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's funny because actually um, lutefisk, you know, is this kind of old world food. It was dry. It was basically a survival food. Yeah. It was dried fish that was then soaked in lye which if you ate it at that point, it would be caustic and basically kill you. And then it has to be rinsed out with water multiple, multiple times. You end up with this kind of very strongly smelling fish jelly. And it's much more popular in Minnesota uh -huh. and the upper North, uh, upper right. Midwest right. Than, than it is in Scandinavia anymore. Yeah. Because it ties oh, funny. Back to this thing. But the other thing you see is like in something like pickled herring, every culture has a version of a pickled fish dish. Like right. you cannot go, you, you choose one and you're yeah. going to find something yeah. like that. So you find these interesting parallels and then you find these surprising, I mean, a, a funny connection between 
my co-author Cecily and I was, I'm from Minnesota. Spam was invented in Minnesota. Ah. Well, in Hawaii by American GIs. Spam is effectively Hawaiian now. They eat more spam per capita than anywhere else. And then it yeah. also ends up in South Korea because, again, of American GIs. And you end up right. with this kind of crazy web of connections uh, between food cultures all over the world. And, and you can almost choose anything and, and see this. Yeah. No, and I think that's cool. And I often think about that, like, you know, with some foods, it's like there's this like, oh, well, it was invented X place. Right. Like, you know, there's a, there's always a lot of uh, talk about barbecue, for example. Yeah. And then, like, in my mind, barbecue was invented when lightning hit the tree and the, the hairy sort of barely standing up person next to it got a whiff. Yeah. Right? I almost feel like I, me personally, I feel like barbecue is probably like pre color, you know, yeah. pre race. You know what I mean? It's yeah. like when we were just like hairy, almost to apes. I, I, you know, and it's funny because I sort of one of the things that I think I really ended up pushing back on in this, the, the, the work of this book is like, there can be this idea of like looking for authentic versions of things. And right. it's basically BS. Like it's, ah. you know, there is authenticity is about sort of the specificity of that experience of that place. It, but mm -hmm. there's no, you know, ramen uses Chinese noodles. Like the, the sort of idea that any dish is, is truly, uh, completely unaffected by the rest of the world of food culture, is it right? And and food evolves all the time. Right. The, the, you know, just because something has changed doesn't make it less authentic. And so I, I just think that there's there's a mistake in sort of like this search for for sort of the true version of something because well, yeah, and it's only true for that minute, right? It's exactly. only true for like that instant. Okay, so there's so many stories in here. This book is amazing. And y'all, let me just hold it up one more time. I want you to go to the cover of my Instagram feed. You're going to like us both and you're going to enter to win a free copy. This is still a substantial book, but how did you make, how did you make the decision about making the cut? Like what was that editorial process like? Because I'm sure you started with like, you know, that yeah. of information. Yeah, it's really hard. I mean, the funny thing is, even though it's a big, big book, you know, hundreds uh, well over 500 kind of major entries. If you include the little things, it's like 700, but it's still limited and there's a lot of world out there. So you're often talking about a few, choosing a few things for, for maybe an entire country. So our rule of thumb was just sort of, was there something in the story that was really surprising that like changed right. the way we thought about a food right. or we was really, um, interesting because we just never, you know, we thought that people had weren't familiar with with the particular kind of history of, of that dish. So we include some things that people are very familiar with, like pad thai, because right. it has an interesting history, because it was sort of invented out of whole cloth by uh, the kind of Thai dictator in the in the 30s as part of a effort to create a sort of national Thai identity out of what were like a lot of different groups. Uh, uh, and and then there's other things where we just thought, God, this story has to go in. You know, I, I particularly love the stuff that ties back to deep history. We have a story mm -hmm. about um, this stuff called uh, Delhi Ball or, or Mad Honey, which you mm -hmm. find in actually you can find it both in Turkey and in Nepal. But we talk about the Turkish version mostly. Um, and it's fascinating on like four different levels. So it it is uh, a kind of psychedelic honey. Uh -huh. Um, and it, uh, grow, the reason it, it exists in this place is because all the rhododendrons that grow in this part uh -huh. of Turkey have a little bit of a neurotoxin in them. Right. And when the bees go around and pollinate all of them, they basically like concentrate it into this honey. And it's usually taken in a small amount, in a little teaspoon it's used for kind of like hypertension and it's actually quite bitter, but it has a lot of medicinal uses taken in a larger amount, like a tablespoon, it can wow. be pretty, um, pretty bad. And we know that this has been uh, used and appreciated for thousands of years, because there's a famous story mm -hmm. about uh, a Roman emperor, Pompey, um, or well, wa wannabe Roman emperor, whatever, leave the, the Roman history aside for a moment. But he, he was he was um, uh, trying to basically get control of this area of Turkey. And they mm -hmm. kept sending soldiers in, it's the Mithric Wars, and uh, fighting this local king named Mithridates. And, uh, and so, he, he, you know, he sends a huge army into this area to fight. And the Roman soldiers, as they're marching along into this area, find all of this like honeycomb conveniently like 
at the side of the road and they eat it. Of course, they're hungry. They're starving. This is like a delicious treat. They all basically start hallucinating, start passing out. And then the story is that Mithridates troops sweep in and basically wipe, wipe them out. So it's just this, it's a food that has sort of connections to deep history. Yeah. It's food. That, those are the stories that we just like lit up. And I have to say, I like that one a hell of a lot more than Helena Troy, right? I mean, yeah. that's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, look at this beautiful honey just sort of sitting out on the side of the road for you. Who needs a fake horse? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, we just tried to find the stories that, that held our interest the most. All right. So we have one question and I'm kind of curious. So all this history that you've done, <laughs> how do you feel like it influences like what you might see for trends? Like everyone's like always trying to figure out like what's the next best thing? What's the next hot thing? So I'm a, how, I'm, how does the history affect your perception of the future? I'm it's uh, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm probably like a curmudgeon on this, like, cause I basically don't, it's, it's very interesting. I think also, I just want to answer a question that I saw pop up yeah. Is there anything about hot dish. Yes. We have an entry about the congressional hot dish competition. This ties back to my own background as a uh, Minnesotan. So Amy Klobuchar is a multiple winner of the, <laughs> the congressional hot I dish competition. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> There's some really, there's some really amazing dishes that have like shown up. She, she did some kind of like, I can't believe it's not spam a hot dish thing at some point. And uh, there was, I, I, one congressman, I have to assume it was a Republican, but I can't remember, did one that was the right to bear arms that used like actual like bear meat, uh, oh, which uh, think about what of that way you will anyway yes there is hot dish in there as all right well you know i have to come i have to be very candid and admit i thought that that was like the next hot dish like that was like the next <laughs> fun thing. so uh forgive me for that ignorance and let's just go ahead and explain Ooh. what hot dish means midwestern man yeah hot dish is what you will find in a church basement after the service has concluded and it is basically casseroles of all sorts i mean okay. they're usually it's a hot dish gotcha. filled with it's things like a tuna casserole is the classic hot I, i'm with you you all you, you know, needed to uh, say was like church and dinner on the grounds i got you tater tots and meat and dairy cream this is all like this is sort of hot dish can be a million different things there's yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no i understand oh that's yeah. wonderful and that's so that is like just that misunderstanding in a, is in a nutshell, right? Like me, not, like me seeing hot dish, and now of course I know what you mean. And but you know, it's like just that. Um, but but it really does come back to like that how integral food is to our lives. And just a just a few more words. Yeah. Church I, basement. It's like oh oh, oh gotcha. <laughs> well, gotcha. church basement could probably be like an entire cookbook on its own because what is in your church basement is different than what is in my church basement, but there is a food culture there. Every church basement yeah. has some deep food culture that is kind of propelling its, its uh, what, what, what is there on the table and on the plate. Um, no, that's true. And I also think, think, think the same thing about funeral food. Oh God. Yeah. Right? We, funeral food is, is such a thing. And you know, it's like, it, it's, it, we need it in a time of comfort but yeah. it's like wildly different all over. Well, I was so excited too um, to see all the different. So you really do cover the world. I mean, you really, really, right. really cover the world. You've got um, Europe, Asia, Africa, Oceania, Canada, the United States, Latin America, and Antarctica. I thought that was crazy. One of my favorite things about Antarctica is it's the food is great. Antarctica, like the food in Antarctica is top notch because it's a it's a place that's pretty monotonous and yeah. it can be depressing. And so almost all of the, the stations on Antarctica, one of the ways that they sort of stand out, that they provide some joy and happiness to the researcher station there is by getting absolutely top notch chefs. And, you know, the big challenge yeah. in Antarctica is you have a very a number of the stations have greenhouses and the real this sort of. <laughs> jealous the, the the real jealousy comes in is because a couple of them have greenhouses that can really produce all year uh, -huh. uh the, the china station the great wall station has apparently an incredible greenhouse and so they have fresh food all year because most of the stations they run out of quote-unquote freshies right. relatively early 
And then they're kind of stuck sort of recombining different canned foods and this things. And they have all these fascinating ways to make things last. They oil. It's like, a, it's like family meal at the restaurant, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it, so, but you know, but, but there are people are eating uh, chicken Parmesan, you know, uh, truffle pasta. Like the people are eating pretty nicely in these Antarctic stations, which is, which is yeah, just cool. Yeah. Well, that makes, you know, that, that really, I have to say, I think that that makes sense. Like if you're monotonous and you're like, you know, freezing cold all the time or, you know, and it's dark or whatever, then, you know, that, that food, it, food is that joy. Um, and I was also excited to see, I, I really love, uh, you know, obviously being from the South and loving the South so much. I love what y'all chose for the South. Yay. Oh, good. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. It's always like, you know, yeah. Uh, anything stand out to you? Uh, well, I really appreciated the information about Georgia Gilmore. So let me, um, oh, yeah. let me get to that page so I can read that a little bit. So this was basically Georgia Gilmore, y'all. Um, became a, a cook and jump in, Dylan, um, working very closely with MLK. And it uh, sounds like she was a big woman and powerful. And she basically was pre-Rosa Parks and didn't want to ride on a bus and walked in the front door and the bus driver kicked her off and she got fired. And then she started cooking for the civil rights movement. Every social movement, really every movement has usually an under-celebrated, under or unrecognized group of women, sometimes one, sometimes many, uh, you know, providing all of the kind of support yeah. system and the food that 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 fundamentally like powers all of the people doing this work. And it's often mm -hmm. really in integral work. I mean, in any work, you know, you go the sort of the, there's a clear civil rights movement connection to food later on in kind of the, the Black Panther movement. People don't tend to think about this, but for a while, the majority of, of Black Panther participants were women, and a huge amount of the work was food kitchens, breakfast. A huge amount of it was about just access and providing food experiences and access to ingredients. And so it's like it's a fundamental part of almost every cultural. It uh, is. You know, no, it's movement. cool. No, and I was. You know, I, I knew of Georgia Gilmore. I knew of the history and I was just so excited to see that because I think yeah. that you're exactly right. And there is there is some woman in a kitchen, most of the time a woman in the kitchen, like feeding the movement, regardless yeah. of what that is. And, you know, that's uh, it's it's really a, a place of power. But OK, just to keep it on the South for a second, y'all. We've got um, the Mobile Bay Jubilee, which I had not heard of. I had never heard of that. And that seems to be when... Um, Basically, there's this huge title title change and salinity change, and all the seafood rushes to the shore. Yeah, so so it happens only in a, a couple of places around the world, and right. the sort of environment has to be just. But Mobile yeah. Bay is one of these places, and it's called a jubilee. And what happens is basically the the oxygen uh, drops really low in this part of the bay, and the fish basically float. They pass out effectively. They float to the surface, and and you can people. It's like a huge party. Everyone like shows up. You scoop up all of this fish. You immediately start like a big uh, boil. You you know people basically just like the next day, next couple of days are are a big party. And and you know it's one of these things where you can't really you don't know when it's going to happen. Like they don't. It's not predictable. So it's, in a weird way, it's not like super, super documented. I mean, we know it, it's yeah. happened, but it's like, it's hard, you know, a little bit more recently because people have cell phones and all of this stuff, but right. it's this kind of thing that like happens and suddenly it's, it's, it's party time. It's cooking time. That's can, fascinating. You, can, you, and can you imagine like what, I always think when I think about something like this, like what was the thought of that, um, first person, the indigenous people, the native American that like experienced that, like whatever, 500 years ago or, th or, or whatever, you know what I mean? Like what, like this amazing, you know, what is this a gift from God? Is it, is it the devil? Is, is it God? But I don't know. There's a lot of sleep in here. And I, you know, I mean, it's just kind of amazing. And then I think too about um, like what you speak of some of the other things, it's like, like, who was the, who was that first person that ate the oyster? I mean, yeah. or, or boiled down sap to make maple syrup. Like uh, our connection with food is just, this permeates, I feel like every, every layer of our body. 
Well, and that's the other thing I think we saw in the book. You know, one of the interesting things about the book is like there are definitely, you know, things in the book that aren't immediately appetizing, right? Like, right. like. Oh, I love that. And you talk about that in the beginning. Hold on. Let me read this. It says, not everything in Gaspar Obscura should be eaten. Some of this, some of the foods in this book are a wonder to learn about, but do harm to partake in. As for the rest, we encourage you to try them. I love that. When I saw that, I'm like, damn, yeah, on that one. I, I mean, the, the the idea, yeah, I mean, I think like, so, so even foods that sort of aren't super appetizing, what's interesting is they, I ended up feeling like the story of food is also the story of human ingenuity. I mean, humans yeah. are just creative creatures who just will sort of try a little bit of everything and how you kind of come up with some, you know, some foods have to be boiled three times before they stop, be, are, aren't poisonous anymore. Right. But we, we figure it out little bit by bit. And so that ingenuity is a real joy to see. And and then as far as sort of the, the, the you know, that opening thing, I think one of the things we wanted to make clear is like, this isn't necessarily a bucket list. It's not sort of like, right. here's all the stuff right. to go. Right. There right. is stuff in this book that probably you don't want to try. Uh, or there's stuff in this book that is interesting to know about, like this kind of caterpillar parasite uh, that is one of the most expensive ingredients in the world, but effectively is being over over harvested and, uh, and climate change is affecting it too. But it's fascinating to know that story. And so sometimes it's enough just to know about something. Uh, not yeah. everything has to be sort of like, oh, when am I, how am I going to make, you know, th this, this caterpillar fungus soup? Because, uh, you, you know, you can go spend $700 on it if you want, though it doesn't really taste like anything. It's got sort of just this like mystical set of, wow. uh, you know, reputation about it. But, but I think um, the flip side of all of that is there are times when seeking out specialty stuff is a mistake because it's being sort of over yeah, yeah uh, sure. over uh, uh, exploited but there are other times when seeking out specialty things I was just talking to someone um, a woman named Nikki Twilly who runs a great podcast called gastropod okay. about the talk apocalypse which is the threat that the various pests the various sort of viruses that affect different uh, chocolate, uh, farms in different parts of the world could combine and it would effectively wipe chocolate. I mean, chocolate would become a thousand dollar uh, chocolate bar kind of thing. Um, but one of the interesting ways you can help with this is by buying interesting varieties of chocolate that are not the kind of main monocultures, because part of the problem yes. is that when you monoculture crops, you end yes. up with these really, really difficult um, sort of pest and virus problems and actually sort of encouraging some diversity of, of um, uh, varieties is actually no, really good. And it, it goes back, I do a lot of work with like uh, sustainable seafood. It goes back to like eat it to save it. Yes. Right. Yes. Like if we, you know, we have to eat it to save it. So like, you know, with the seafood, um, as I know, you know, but maybe some of the folks watching, it's like the United States, we eat like salmon and tuna and shrimp. And we have to start eating some other things because otherwise we're just going to eat them to death, eat them off the earth. That's and right. life would not be worth with living without chocolate. So we've got, I'm going to do my part. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go eat more chocolate. Good, good. More interesting, weird chocolate. I think that's, that's more interesting, weird chocolate. So, so what is next? I mean, the reception to this book has been amazing. So, I mean, have you, did you have a ton on the cutting room floor and you're going to come back for volume two? Or are you just like, just going to keep celebrating the hell out of this awesome he book? I think we'll do a couple of things. We, th there are, so, you know, the, the, uh, along with the book, the website continues to to yeah, run and add more stuff out. all the time, and um, and we're talking about you know doing more specifically a cookbook, uh, so something that really provides some really you know practical, useful recipes that like doesn't yeah. call for ingredients that are like impossible right. to find, but really still lets you use cooking as a way into history, into culture, into travel. And so I think that's that's coming down the line. And uh, you we're doing a, a collaboration. This is sort of still under the hat, but I think it's okay to talk about. We're doing a, a really fun collaboration with a, I won't name them, a beer, a beer brand 
Um, oh, yay! Good kind for of, you. Um, they were really inspired by the book. And so they came to us and said, we want to make a beer kind of based on uh, oh, this. Oh, man, that's book. so, so we're, cool. We're going to do that so later. Cool. And I had a lot of fun stuff. Some We run Gastro Obscura Trip. So we take people huh? all over the world to experience the world through its... its uh, culinary experiences so all of this is kind of on on the deck yeah oh my god well i am so glad i'm so glad we worked out the tech problem i'm so glad that you were a guest today i'm so Thank glad to share me. this book with with folks and to 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 see your great work and then all right i've got a, a couple of questions sure. so you did mention um just to kind of wrap up so you mentioned a podcast earlier who are some of the people look for you for information who are some of the cool people that you like to watch Oh, like who do I like in, in the podcast space? Uh, or, the, or, yeah. or like just tech in general, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, it's been fun because we have our we have a daily podcast, the Atlas Obscura podcast. So okay. I've gotten to talk to a lot of really interesting people. Nikki Twilly of Gastropod is an mm -hmm. amazing writer uh, about food, um, really kind of science and food and where they meet. Um, we work with he I haven't spoken to him for the podcast, but uh, we've done some videos with a guy named Michael Twitty. Um, uh -huh. And yep. Michael Pretty is just a fantastic culinary historian, um, great writer about food. Yep. We, um, who else do I think is great? So from my hometown of Minneapolis is a guy named Sean Sherman. Oh uh, yeah, um, yeah. Sean is yeah, amazing. Chef. Chef. Was, you know, and there's it's yep. it's not just in the U.S. You're seeing an interest in kind of indigenous foodways happening across yeah. the world. So it's happening in Australia, kind of can we bring back some of the indigenous foodways that got kind of disrupted and destroyed in yeah. colonization? And so I, that's a really like wonderful thing to see happening sort of in the U S and worldwide. So those are people who jump to mind right off. No, the that's so cool. Well, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on your awesome book. And y'all, this book is available everywhere. Thank so you, I, 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 make sure to reach out, seek out your local independent booksellers, but also it's available at all the big box stores and the, and the, and the billionaire websites. Too. Yeah, you. <laughs> uh, you awesome. will order it for you if you ask. They will no, definitely. this is true. Awesome, Dylan. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you. Thank you for having me. I, okay. I, it's okay. Bye. Bye. Oh, y'all, I could just keep on and keep on and keep on. So thank you so much for your patience uh, with the with the tech problems. But I was like, we're going to talk about this book because I just think this book is fantastic. So um, thank you so much for watching Cookbooks with Virginia. Um, I've got some great folks coming up. We've got Spice Box Kitchen, um, Indian Food. I've got Unbelievably Vegan. I've got Bagel Schmears and Fish uh, with Kathy Barrow. Tons of great guests coming up. And um, for those of you that might have seen some of my stuff earlier in the week, y'all don't worry. I'm not going anywhere. I just want to do some things different. But lots more news on that. Thank you so much for watching Cookbooks with Virginia. Bon appetit, y'all, and have a great day. Really appreciate you watching. All right. Bye-bye now.